Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this panel on supply chain connectivity in a changing global economy. I'm Melinda Crane. I'm the chief political correspondent at Deutsche Welle Television, and it is a great pleasure to accompany you today as moderator. The direction of change in the global economy is once again a matter of uncertainty and also uh, for uh, some a matter of concern. But the fact is that even before the current tensions over trade and protectionism, globalization was in flux. After a phase of retrenchment following the financial crisis, trade flows did begin rebounding in 2017, but to rates significantly lower than annual growth prior to the crisis. In fact, economists, many economists, see little prospect of a sustained return to earlier rates of increase. Not only the absolute volume, but also the patterns of international trade are shifting with Asia and Africa likely to see substantial increases in future. These changes, of course, have crucial implications for growth and for international freight transport and for value chains. Improving supply chain connectivity is more important than ever in this current environment, for it can help reduce costs and raise volumes and thereby maximize the benefits of trade, even in the face of slowing and or shifting patterns. In this session, we want to take a closer look at precisely how changes in the global distribution of economic activity are affecting the flow of goods and at what stakeholders can do to enhance connectivity's contribution to growth, social integration, and sustainable development. We have a really great roster of panelists to address these issues. I'd like to once again say a very warm welcome to all of them and thanks for joining us for this discussion. I will introduce them shortly, but to get us started to launch our discussion and illustrate the potential benefits and policy tools that we will be examining in more depth, I would like to present uh, or ask uh, our uh, speaker to present a joint ITF-OECD study on freight connectivity in Central Asia. And for that purpose, it is my pleasure to welcome the ITF's Olga Petrik. She is the report's main author, and she will now say uh, some words about its findings. So the floor is yours, Olga. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very glad here to present our a new report, which was published just uh, the last week, which is called Enhancing Connectivity and Freight in Central Asia. Uh, this study was financed by the government of Kazakhstan, and uh, in this study we cover uh, countries, five countries, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Mongolia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And uh, of course, the main uh, aim of this study was uh, to help to the countries to improve their connectivity, uh, especially uh, freight connectivity. And uh, this study had three parts, but um, as I don't have much time today, uh, I would like to concentrate on the part which is most relevant for this session, and it's uh, the part where we analyze the regional connectivity using uh, the ITF international freight model, and uh, we also analyze the future investment plans of these countries and so how it would affect uh, the connectivity in these countries. And uh, I would like first to say uh, a couple of words about this region. It's a very challenging and interesting region. Challenging because uh, these countries have a very low uh, population density. And uh, also, this, all these five countries are landlocked. And, uh, but it's a very interesting region, of course, because it's on the way, uh, on the main trade route between uh, uh, China and Europe. And, uh, uh, on the historical uh, Silk Road, and of course it, it, this region became very uh, interesting uh, also after uh, China has announced its uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, uh, first what we did at the ITF when we started the study, we uh, computed so-called uh, connectivity index, what you could can see at this map, it's basically uh, how much GDP, global GDP, each country can reach compared to other countries in the world, and as you can see, while North America and Europe have very good performance, uh, Central Asia has a very poor performance compared to other countries. And of course, the main reason of, one of the main reasons of this is that these country, uh, countries are landlocked. As you can see, we tried to decompose this connectivity 
index and see why uh, these countries uh, perform uh, so poorly. And uh, the gray area in this pie chart uh, represents the distance, which of course cannot be changed because uh, countries cannot change their geographical position. But there are th three other factors which uh, countries can work with and try to improve and try to compensate their uh, geographical position, which are uh, border crossing, uh, costs, and uh, speed. And of course, countries are trying to improve uh, their transportation systems, and there are several uh, also uh, international initiatives in the in the region. Of course, a famous Belt and Road Initiative by uh, the government of China, and also a CAREC program run by uh, Asian Development Bank. Uh, CAREC means uh, Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program, with uh, lots of transportation projects. Um, planned and even already some of them have been implemented in this region with 11 countries participating. And so what we did at the ITF, we actually uh, added these new planned links to our international freight model and tried to see how these uh, new links would affect um, the connectivity and the future trade flows. And uh, also, as you probably know, at the ATF, we also do some projections of uh, traffic flows for future. So we also, uh, so given these projections, if there will be still bottlenecks remaining in this region, even if they build all this new infrastructure. And uh, as you can see, for example, in this map, uh, by 2030, and even, even the countries built this infrastructure, there still be, uh, will be some um, bottlenecks remained. And, um, uh, I hope you can see uh, at this map the blue lines are the correct corridors, but the bottlenecks uh, will be not only along these corridors, but also outside of these corridors. And it's one of the uh, conclusions of our study that the country should really focus also on the uh, local connectivity, not only on these big international corridors. And uh, another thing what our uh, international freight mo model allows to test was uh, what would happen if the countries improve not only their hard infrastructure but also like soft infrastructure, what we call, and in this case we uh, tested what would be if the countries reduce uh, border crossing time to a level of Latvia, which is quite a good performer. And um, as you can see in this um, graph, uh, the green uh, bar and the dark blue bars are the two bars corresponding to uh, improved infrastructure, all the, uh, if the countries build all this infrastructure, and the dark blue bar is what if the countries improve their border crossing time. And as you can see, the benefits in uh, connectivity index are actually comparable. And um, also, so these are just two examples of the results, as I don't have much time to result all the results of our study. And so if uh, I have to say a few just very high level uh, findings of our study, uh, just to summarize in a few words, then of course um, one of the main findings is that the distance and being landlocked can never be eliminated by, by these countries, but uh, the countries can try to compensate through appropriate policy measures. And um, the countries must focus also on local connectivity, not only on big corridors, and uh, to provide uh, access to the firms, to the companies, to these corridors. And um, of course, these countries are very excited that they are on this way between Europe and China. So they uh, they are happy. They uh, they would like to benefit from transit and to attract some flow. But of course, we wa we warn the countries that uh, transit will not bring only benefits, but also the countries will have to manage negative outcomes such as environmental problems and uh, increased um, um, infrastructure maintenance costs. And uh, of course, as, as you could see, border crossing, improving border crossing is as important as all this new infrastructure and it's probably even cheaper in some cases to improve it and uh, easier to, than to build these huge uh, infrastructure projects. And uh, uh, of course, these countries sometimes are lacking in institutional capacity, and it's very important for them to develop their own institutional capacity, especially in the danger of uh, increased debt. So that the countries really should try to uh, find uh, the most uh, uh, beneficial projects for themselves, and they have to be able to find this pro uh, to analyze this themselves. And finally, um, the regional cooperation. The current uh, level of regional cooperation is very weak because the the intra-regional trade in this region is only 5% of all trade of these countries, which shows how poor cooperation is at the moment, because these countries are neighbors, they have similar historical background, similar languages, but still um, 
they can improve their cooperation much more. And uh, the report, as I said, was published last week, so it's available in two languages, in English and in Russian, alone uh, this link on our website. And um, yes, thank you very much. I hope this also can fuel uh, the discussion today. Thank you very much to Olga Petrik for taking us through that and also uh, in a very concise uh, version. So I appreciate that very much. I will now ask our panelists to please join uh, me on stage and then I will be uh, pleased to introduce you afterward. And I'll ask you to please sit down in alphabetical order starting with Mr. Cotton right there and, uh, and then uh, Mr. Georges. Um, next to Mr. Cotton, if you would, uh, and then Mr. Labor, next to Mr. Georges, then Mr. Mussolino, please, and finally Mr. Tiwari. So, thank you very much. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our panel, starting again uh, to your right, ladies and gentlemen, with Stephen Cotton. He is General Secretary of the International Transport Workers Federation, a global union federation of 665 trade unions, representing 18.5 million transport workers in 147 countries, and ranging from maritime and port to aviation, road, rail, and urban transport sectors. Great to have you with us. Welcome. Seated next to him is Bruno Georges. He is Secretary General of the Central Commission for the Navigation of the Rhine, which for the past 200 years has been dedicated to regulating and promoting regulation on one of Europe's most busy and important uh, waterways. And he was previously a member of the Belgian Diplomatic Corps. Great to have you with us. Next to him is Mr. Christian Labreau. He is the president of the International Road Transport Union. His 40-year career in transport included leadership of uh, BWV, which is the German Association of Professional Transport Companies and Shippers. Welcome to you. And uh, I'm very pleased as well that Pino Mussolino can be with us. He's president of the North Adriatic Seaport Authority, and he's an expert on maritime and commercial law, has previously worked with Hapag Lloyd, for example, as corporate insurance risk manager for the Middle East. Great to have you here. And finally, I'm very glad to welcome Sunandan Tiwari. He's Director of Global Implementation in the World Secretariat of ICLEI, the Global Network of Governments for Sustainability. Shouldn't that be local and regional governments, right? Somehow I deleted that. Um, and he's currently coordinating a project with multiple countries in the Global South that focuses on developing plans for sustainable urban freight. So great to have you with us as well. I'd like to begin by asking all of you to briefly, and with briefly I really do mean two to three minutes, if you would please, to briefly share your perspective on changes in the global economy that in your view are affecting trade, transport, and logistics in your particular region or sector in an important way. And again, I'll just go straight down the panel starting with Mr. Cotton. Thanks, Manali. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss with you today. I think it's a little bit difficult for the ITF because we cover the other ITF. We cover all of the transport sectors. And our recognition at the moment is there's a degree of instability because of the geopolitical situation, which, um, depending on which stock exchanges you were monitoring this morning, you can see the volatility. But we also have to recognise, and we look at the study here, that uh, China is trying to change the game. And part of that conversation about the One Belt, One Road initiative is a particular uh, interest to, to us in the global labour movement. Last year we had our con Congress and we identified Asia Pacific and particularly global supply chains as core areas of the changing face of transportation. And so for us, this work, um, we, we are the only global union federation that has a partnership with the ACFTU, which is the Chinese labour movement, and we're part of a conversation about their One Belt, One Road initiatives. And you might ask, why would that be interesting for us? Well, as you saw from, from the geographical map, um, that political influence that is happening is an opportunity for us in the global labour movement to talk about the cost of transportation. So on one level we have trade issues, on another level we have a challenge to ensure that transportation isn't too cheap. 
because that's one of the problems we have at the moment about building a sustainable model. So for us in the ITF, it's about let's engage in a conversation, let's talk to all of those countries along that supply chain, let's talk about the co hub and corridor, the changing, we can touch on emissions I think a little bit later, but the challenges we have to modernise transportation. And it's clear that the government in China and the Chinese bank is putting serious investment into infrastructure and that's partly missing in some of the other regions we tackled. We identified Southeast Asia as massive growth. We've been monitoring Africa, there's challenges there about infrastructure, but the money that China's putting in to the Global South economies is an opportunity for them, but also an opportunity for us um, with a responsibility in transportation to take the challenges. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will pick up uh, on a couple of those points a little bit later on. Bruno Georges. Well, thank you and uh, good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure to be uh, in Leipzig and take an active part in ITF. On behalf of the CCNR, this central commission, largely unknown and largely, more largely, if I may, uh, on behalf of inland navigation, inland waterway transport, that uh, rarely appears in that kind of discussion. Um, when, when we speak of the, the changing global environment, you referred yourself and my, my neighbor to, uh, to the insecurity, the volatility. Uh, there are those developments of new trade routes. There are other impacts also coming from environmental issues. I know that you will uh, come back to that, but that has an influence on the kind of uh, reactions of our societies also in the way, the way we, we, we carry out uh, our, the trade. When you look at the ITF uh, Transport uh, Outlook 2019, you see that there are uh, forecasts up to 2050 of a possible tripling of, uh, of trade. That means that all transport modes will be, uh, will be bound to, to, to take a role in this and make sure that uh, uh, it happens in a sustainable way. And inland waterway transport is surely part of that exercise joint to exercise for that when we have uh, those uh, trade flows coming in in seaports you will you will need uh, by definition access to hinterland and you will continue to need a strong uh, inland waterway transport besides the the road and and rail transport to, to achieve this, uh, we need, of course, to follow uh, closely the different uh, uh, kinds of, um, of goods being transported. If you look at this energy transition issue, uh, you will see a, a reduction of a number of goods coming in that may have an impact directly on the kind of uh, inland waterway transport you have. If you develop uh, containers, as has been the case for a number of years uh, due to these uh, changes, in international trade, you will need to develop container transportation also on river, uh, on river, uh, on rivers, and this is a general phenomenon for which the, the Rhine itself is uh, is certainly um, uh, on, on top. But to do that, you have to make sure, again, that those infrastructures, the challenges are there. Uh, you need to make sure that, uh, that the bridges and infrastructure follow uh, the needs for transport. If you look at the trade routes, and I'm, I'm grateful to uh, um, the previous uh, uh, representative of uh, ITF uh, about Central Asia and the landlocked countries, you, you see this one belt, uh, one road uh, uh, infrastructure and connection that has a direct impact also on inland navigation. If you, if you see uh, th those goods coming in in another way, uh, new trade routes uh, by rail, uh, but then they will need uh, this intermodality, this connectivity where we can uh, end feed and, and facilitate those exchanges. A last a challenge when I, I, I think of those container, uh, you will see with the biggest, uh, the big alliances being uh, set up in the maritime sector. For many seaports, it has become a huge issue to manage uh, those uh, huge numbers of containers. And for interland and for inland navigation, it has become an issue as well. So this is, this is very much uh, a challenge to be, uh, to be taken up. But I'm sure we will come back to yeah. other issues uh, uh, later. We will indeed, because you mentioned several uh, facets of a, a greater need for integration, and I certainly want to pick up on that a bit uh, later on. Mr. Lebrault. 
thank you very much and thank you as well for inviting IU and me to take part in this panel. If we are talking about uh, changing global economy, so we are talking about trade flows and if I remember years ago, it not so many years ago, we had been talking about the challenges of globalization <clears throat> and what does this mean for, for uh, transport and logistics. Now, after, let's say, looking at a little bit more of protectionism, we are looking to the change of trade flows again, so, but not, no more on a big global level, so more maybe concentrating on a regional or a, a nearer a level. But I, I think, nevertheless, uh, in an economy, commercial road transport plays always an irreplaceable role to, to connect every business, uh, either in a small village or on a global market. So the supply chain we are talking about always starts and ends with uh, road transport. And uh, I think road transport is uh, the vehicle for economic and social integration. That's why, for example, IU as uh, the World Organization for Road Transport deals as well with uh, transport and logistics at our freight sector, <clears throat> but as well on the mobility of people, that's our passenger sector. And if we are here in Leipzig, allow me one remark. Um, it was mentioned by our minister in the opening plenary. Uh, it's now 30 years ago uh, that we have the reunification of, of Germany. And one, one of the, the main pillars of, of this process was that people lost mobility. Uh, they, they feel prisoned, and that's, that's why they go on the streets. They, they want to travel, they want to, to have products from all over the world. The, this uh, intent has, has moved uh, a lot in, in Germany, and if we are talking about Korea and maybe a possible reunification, it's, it's a process as well. It's always mobility of goods and, and people driving uh, this process. And uh, of course, as IU, we will, I think we will come on to this point later on. We have the uh, mandate of the United Nations uh, with the TIA Convention that uh, possibility to facilitate uh, trade all over the world, and as well if we talk about different modes of transport or uh, talking about uh, One Belt on Road initiatives, especially to China and the uh, Asian uh, corridor. And what drives us at IU at the moment, uh, if you ask for some main topics, of course uh, there are many others as well, but uh, under the uh, perspective of facilitating road transport, it's uh, the point of digitalization. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's, uh, for, to give you two examples, for, ex for example, the uh, ECMR, the electronic uh, document for, for transport, or mentioning the U United Nations Convention, and maybe we talk about this later, uh, the tier convention, the digital tier. Right. Uh, to, to facilitate cross-border uh, movements to, and so on. I want to come back to that in more yeah. detail, so I'll just okay. let you give that headline and then we'll, we'll uh, move back to it a little bit later on. Mr. Mussolino. Thank you. Well, thank you for putting up such a, a great lineup because, you, you know, it's not always so, so common that you have the workers, uh, so the labor side and then the road side and then the inland navigation side and the seaport side and then experts from, from the market. Normally we, we talk one way, you know, and, and I do believe that the most important thing that we need to tackle right now in terms of supply chain and the changes that we're facing is to have a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. You know, ports tended to talk only about ports and then the labor things only about labor things and everybody was in, a, in his own separate bubble, uh, which doesn't work. It's in itself uh, the contrary of logistics, you know, that, that should be connecting things that are moving into intermodality and different uh, model ways. So we, we do that every day, but we don't think in that way every day. And, and the biggest challenge or, or the best challenge that we have to tackle is that we need to think that we're all literally a ring of a chain. We, we, we use that metaphor, but we don't think in that way. And for example, on the IDF outlook uh, 2019, it was very significant to see that, that the, the forecast is that by 2050, there will be exactly the same amount of seaborne goods, more or less 75%, 75 to 80%. So again, ships and ports will be still super relevant, even though nowadays, uh, well, thanks to our Chinese friends, 
they're becoming again very very much hyped but until recently the ports were, were sort of like well yeah somewhere there there's something that is connecting land and 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 sea and so on and so forth and all these uh, well somebody else said that uh, the changes in the form or in the uh, uh, ways that we are uh, intending logistics will be completely different. Well, I mean, the things that will happen in the next five to 10 years will be so disruptive from AI. Well, you know, everybody was talking about blockchain, but what I think will be most disruptive will be AI applied to big data so that mm -hmm. we will be able to process a lot of information and putting them together into a way that will give us answers even before we, we know that we want them, so to say. But that will have a big implication, and I saw Mr. Cotton uh, you know, smiling, in terms of labor, because then you need to build also social acceptability in terms of, of having an infrastructure in a place. You know, I, I just think about our friends in Rotterdam, Mas Vlaktetve, super amazing uh, project, but then now they have a lot of issues with the people because people are losing jobs and they just asking and wondering, what, why do I need to have the negative externality of having a port there when I don't have the positive trade-off of jobs right. and, and creation of wealth? So all these things cannot be tackled uh, alone because then there will be holes in our, in our uh, way of thinking. And this is probably the biggest challenge that we have to face. We, we need to reprogram our brains and think in a different way because otherwise you, you fix, you know, the blanket will be too small and you fix a problem there and, and you create another one some, somewhere else in, in, along the chain. So this probably is the biggest challenge. And a, a small notation, if I may, is just, we are all talking about like instability and, and how inst unstable are these times. Were there ever stable times before? I mean, when you are living them in the present, they are always looking messy. And when you look back retrospectively, they look much easier because yeah. you are not living them and you found already the solutions. So I wouldn't be so negative, so to say, because every age had its own uh, issues. Thank you very much. And uh, we will do a deeper dive also on that issue of coordination uh, that you underlined, uh, collaboration essentially uh, in, in t together with the question of integration. So, um, Mr. Tiwari, uh, your introductory thoughts. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. So I would like to propose that while we are talking about these global changes that you really need to also be extremely inclusive and bring the local into the dialogue as well. Uh, another point that I would like to specify is by you're looking at global changes in the economy, we need to look at three other global phenomena that we are experiencing now. One is that of urbanization, around climate change, and also biodiversity loss that we are looking at, and these three are very closely interlinked. These four, I would say, are very closely interlinked and need to be looked at, at their interdependencies and how they affect, they affect one another. So cities are typically centers of concentrations of people, of power, of very high resource use. They uh, also drive economic growth with contributing to the GDP. Uh, but if you look at trends of urbanization, we see that 90% of the urban population growth is expected to take place in Asia and Africa. If you look at the changes in the global trade, what we also see is that we expect a decrease in OECD countries and an increase in non-OECD countries, and especially in Asia and Africa. So, you know, when you, when you put these two together and you lay, overlay them together, you see that you are probably having a compounded effect that you're going to have to deal with. Um, add to that the fact that for the trade, in, for the increased trade in these two continents, there would be a need for infrastructure. And there has to be investments towards this infrastructure. If you bring in the climate change and the biodiversity angle into it, how do we then climate proof a lot of this infrastructure to safeguard our investments, and also to ensure that the connectivity is maintained and trade can be carried out smoothly. So you have that, and from a biodiversity perspective, what our global assessment that was released just last month shows that we have to work towards a zero net biodiversity loss approach. We, we do not, and that basically connects back to the issue of how we plan our land use. And when you're looking at supply chain connectivity, that's where land use comes in, that's the link to biodiversity. So, 
I would just like to s finish here by saying that we are faced with yet another wicked problem and that the cities are actually at the heart of it. Thank you very much for that. I want to come back to some of the environmental sustainability issues, but let me just ask uh, one or two follow-up questions on social sustainability. Um, and uh, to you first, uh, Stephen Cotton, um, two aspects really. One, you mentioned Chinese investment. Um, we often hear China makes its investments with little regard for consequences for local populations, uh, for local environments, and so on. So that would be part one of my question. And part two would be in general, amongst the shifts that we've seen with supply chains growing increasingly complex under increasingly increasing pressure for flexibility, speed, and so on, that many workers, although they're actually increasingly in demand, are facing precarious employment conditions, thanks to the fact that more and more companies, uh, logistics co companies in particular, are using agency temp workers. So per perhaps you can address both of these aspects of the social sustainability equation. Okay, so thank you. Kind of two rather large yes. issues, um, and I think if you if you look at it, and we've been doing a lot of studies, if you look at it, precarious work. I think 77% of young workers, that's we define as under 35, are in precarious work, compared to 56% of the general population. So we have an age profile challenge because of precarious work. Then if we look at the challenge that women face about getting uh, pay equality, these are also issues that we're looking at across the whole of the process. I think. In the big conversation, um, we have partners here at IRU, UITP, the ITF is working with all the stakeholders to look at these issues and there are a number of factors where we need to tackle it. So the first is under um, imp implementation of regulations that exist now. So if we look at the global supply chain and you just look at the size of the world and the challenges we have and we touch on Asia Pacific and Africa, there is abuses even in Europe where we have truck drivers who aren't from Europe, disrespecting the European Union's rules about time, regulation, safety. And those are issues where we work together to make sure the sustainable regulations are part of the answer. So for us, we recognise that e-commerce, we see the future will be a fight between transportation, logistics companies and software companies, which I think comes up later, about who's in control of the global supply chain. And our request with our partners, and I'm quite proud to say that, uh, is that we challenge governments and the regulatory bodies to enforce the rules. Because ultimately you have to enforce the rules, and it could be tax, it could be employment legislation, it could be as simple as making sure wages are paid. Those are the fundamental principles. So we, we all believe globalisation improves, takes people out of poverty, but it has to be within a framework of social responsibility. So that's that question. In respect to China, um, as I said, we're the only organisation in the global labour movement that sits down and talks to them, and that's a mutual respect conversation. That's about sharing our values. So the ITF has uh, got a very strong constitution, free and democratic trade unions with proper constitutions about elections. Our conversation with China is what do we share and how do we learn? Part of their challenge is multinationals, um, and we describe the better multinationals as the coalition of willing, who want to improve the global supply chain, who want to audit their own system systems, um, and we're encouraging the Chinese to understand from our experience that you have to enforce the rules, you have to organise, you have to promote health and safety and regulation, and then the governments um, and the various departments have to enforce it. On the question of distribution of skills and, and workers' capabilities. Um, the ITF is privileged to lead a global organisation, but recently I was in Algeria where the airport was built by Chinese labour um, and there hasn't been enough skills transfer. I was in Antigua, which sounds like a strange place, but it's a very good hub for the Caribbean. Their new port terminals being built by Chinese labour and again, there's not enough transferring of skills because ultimately Global South, what do we need? We need new job opportunities and we need skills transfer. Mm -hmm. And that's a conversation we're determined to take up with China. We understand One Belt, One Road is a, is a political agenda to build an economic model and 
you know, congratulations with that. We recognise that it's built on the pillar of 5G and we're not really doing future of work, but that's part of the conversation when it comes to infrastructure. So for us in the ITF, it's simple stuff. Make sure you enforce the regulations. Make sure we have new regulations for the global economy that deals with discharging cargo from one place to another part of the world. We didn't touch on, in, in, the, in the greatest sense, that we'll see value cargoes. Part of the conversation, part of the changing supply chain, is certain cargoes have higher value and therefore the need to move them quicker yeah. and move them from one place to another will put pressure on the supply chains. But also we believe that's an opportunity. So we do need to deal with waiting times at borders. We do need to deal with consistent legislation that makes sure the minimum standard and the framework protects the social, the worker, but also the communities across the, the supply chain as a whole. Two fairly long answers, but Thank difficult you. subjects. Thank, very interesting answers. Thank you very much. Mr. Labour, you also had a comment. Only a, a very short comment. I, I think what, what we suffer uh, is uh, the recognition of the sector. So because everybody takes it as easy and simple to, to hold a supply chain, to, to deliver everything we want uh, in always a shorter time, uh, you order your Amazon or your, your package and uh, you do it now and if, if you come to your hotel room or your, your home you want to have delivered this, but at the same time you complain about the uh, small delivery truck parking in the <laughs> second or third row blocking, blocking you with, with your car. But, but it's, it's a problem of the society as well. It's, it's a problem of the society as well, uh, how we behave. So that, that's one part of, of the game. We are producing more and more uh, packages, for example, it's, it's the fastest growing uh, sector in, in transport and logistics. It's, it's a parcel sector, Korea and ex Express. In, in Germany, the volume doubles every three years. Uh, that's especially for inner city and regional uh, problems, but, but as well for, for the global uh, um, supply chain. But, but nevertheless, for, for me, one of the most important points, looking to, to Stephen as, as well, if we are talking about drivers and, and uh, other personnel, it's uh, uh, the recognition of, of the sector. Transport and logistics, I, I know the, the figures for Germany, is the third biggest sector in, in Germany. But if you talk to people, where are you working in, um, in transport and logistics, oh, oh what a lousy job. So that, that's what, what we have to, to trigger as well. And if we are talking about drivers, uh, I think we, we should be keen enough to, to look at the, uh, not only to challenges, but to the opportunities as well, as well with uh, changing to digital uh, and supporting function. I'm, I'm not talking about uh, self-driving uh, vehicles, autonomous vehicles, but uh, many assistance system uh, where the drivers need higher skills and if we have more recognition as well then we will tr uh, treat the drivers and the logistic personnel better it will help as well so only this short remark to to Stephen as well thank you very much does anybody else want to say anything about shifting trade and uh, social issues before I move on to environmental please mr. Josh I may thank you, Madam Moderator. I think this idea of uh, you speak of recognition of a sector, I think it's true for transport as a whole, and it is true also for uh, the sustainable mode of transport of inland navigation. You're, you're quite right. And I think this is an issue that, is, uh, that we're facing. Uh, if you look at uh, the reaction of our societies vis-a-vis -vis noise uh, pollution or uh, some, some other kinds of uh, pollutant emissions, 
uh, the proximity of, uh, of uh, uh, vessels close to city centers, which brings a lot of issues in terms of uh, mooring, uh, berthing places, and it makes uh, the, 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 the performance of transport ever more difficult. This kind of acknowledgement of our societies close to cities, bring, uh, sending out uh, uh, harbors or making it difficult for them to grow, the, the exact recognition and acknowledgement of transport in, in, in our societies is very much there. When we speak of disruptive uh, tendencies in the ITF outlook, it might indeed be one of those uh, to, to reckon with. I, I think this, the, the, our societies uh, evolve and they have different feelings and we have to, to, uh, to take them into account. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Mussolini, now you had a comment? I don't want to broaden too much the, the whole thing, but then it goes very much to the whole idea of progress and growth and development that we have. We're still sticking on an idea of development that is very much 20th century somehow. You know, about the more we produce, the better it is, the more GDP, the better it is. Why in the equation now we need to put also the sustainability factor and what is sustainable is not just uh, environmentally sustainable, is socially sustainable, economically sustainable, even culturally sustainable. If you are destroying the sense of a community by building an infrastructure, are, is it still a sign of growth and development, that infrastructure? Because if you base the, the evaluation of that only by, is it plus or minus, maybe, but if then it's a, it's a sort of atomic bomb in a community, then, then the equations and the results of the equation is changing completely. Sorry, I didn't want to, to make it no, no. So, so broad, That's, but it, uh, it is part of yeah. the, the things that we need to think as a planners and developers. Absolutely. That's a great intervention, and that takes us right into the environmental uh, aspects. So let me uh, perhaps come to you to get us started with that, Mr. Tiwari. And certainly in logistics, the highest costs and externalities are often associated with that first and last mile, which will, in many cases, be the city. And um, I wonder what that means for the cities that you work with and whether you can give us a few concrete examples of approaches that cities are using to help develop environmentally, also, if you will, socially sustainability, urban freight strategies and measures. And that may go to the double parked delivery vans, but maybe it also goes to the pay for those delivery van drivers who, as I understand it, are ha taking home very little pay uh, indeed. Right. So I, th I think on this issue, very often the ways, I'm, I mean, upfront, I think it's important to acknowledge that cities are focus a lot more on passenger transport rather than urban freight. And therefore, the way they engage with urban freight is also through the externalities that are caused by urban freight. A lot to do with the pollution that you kind of get, noise, air pollution, and so on. Safety issues in terms of large trucks kind of going, going through neighborhoods, and how do you deal with that. Uh, so. I think cities are only now beginning to engage a lot more on this issue of urban freight and seeing what is the critical role that they actually play around that. Uh, just to give an example of what we at ICLA are doing in trying to build some of some integrated solutions working with cities on this is a program project called Ecologistics, the one that you referred to by introducing me. Uh, and in this, we are trying to work with cities in Colombia, Argentina, and in India. It's covering about nine to 10 cities. And how do we actually develop sustainable urban freight action plans for these cities so that they are, they give a, the pro, a priority to health and safety while also looking at a people-centered and low emission development strategies. So I think what that also intrinsically has is a, a sense of circularity and a circular development as well as to how do you look at material flows within a city and, um, uh, and therefore how does a city actually really engage with that. So I would say that there are limited examples of where you know where there's really an integrated kind of an approach to where cities are actually working on this, but this is an area that is growing, and there are some cities that are already looking at a lot of urban freight from a decarbonization perspective, where they're looking at, you know, in terms of uh, 
regulating the flow of urban freight vehicles from a temporal and spatial perspective in terms of where they load and load, and also now talking about fuel shifts and so on. Uh, and there are initiatives from South America that we could look at in terms of Bogota, where they are looking at setting up an urban logistics network, where they want to use that as a platform to engage a lot more with the private sector so that there can be an exchange of um, information between the city and the private sector and also as a strategic tool for them to really engage. Some cities in India and other places, what they're looking at is how do you actually integrate land use planning and transport planning, and that is a very messy area when you come to land, land use and so on, because this, there are a lot of vested interests around this very increasingly scarce resource. There's also the whole area in terms of e-mobility, where people are now increasingly working. You have a number of startups which are looking at vehicles with different capacities. Um, you're also, yesterday I heard of this very interesting concept of BAS, bus, about looking at battery as a service so that you have a minimum downtime. You can just have charged batteries all the time available to you. And that was, that was interesting. So there's a lot happening there, but I would just say we are just literally scratching the surface at the moment. We cities really need to delve much deeper into this. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Let me ask uh, you, Mr. Lebro, to talk a little bit about how you see the environmental implications of that uh, expansion of trade and transport along the One Belt, One Road corridors uh, that uh, uh, you have all said we will most definitely see that kind of a shift. Clearly, that will lead to more CO2 emissions. How can that best be tackled? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. I, of course, uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative is a great chance for, for road transports, for the road transport sector, because uh, if you look to, to the uh, supply chain at the moment, uh, there's not so much road transport uh, with, with trucks between China along the Belt and Road uh, to Europe. Uh, we are running some trains, for example, to, to, to the German Duisburg port, um, and uh, a lot of things are transported by, by plane. So only to, to take this example, and if you look, if you substitute, uh, let's say, a lot of these uh, time-critical uh, um, air transport uh, by road, so it, it maybe it, it saves emission as well, com because I, I think compared with air transport, road transport is, uh, is um, less, uh, has less emissions uh, than, than air transport. But, but of course, we, we will have some, some growth here, but um, um, I think it does not mean that the growth of emissions is uh, on the same level like the, the growth of, of the volume of, of the goods transported. And um, we, as uh, you had already committed um, to minimize uh, emissions already 10 to 12 years ago with our 30% uh, goal uh, to, to reach out 30% uh, less emissions on uh, 2030. So uh, I think it was <coughs> the road transport sector and not the air transport sector who had uh, this commitment uh, first. Uh, when I heard uh, the IATA representative in the, in the plenary, <coughs> But nevertheless, that's, that's, that's not the important thing who, who uh, take the initiative first. It's, it's uh, how to act. And, and I think there's a lot of uh, possibilities uh, to have growth, but to reduce emissions at the same time. For, for IU, for example, there are five to six uh, pillars uh, uh, looking at this. Of course, it's, uh, if we talk about decarbonization, it's uh, fuel efficiency. So for the constructors to, if you look to a truck 10 years ago, it's, it's around, let's say, more than 40 liters per 100 kilometers in average. Now in Germany, we, ha we have trucks driving with, under normal conditions, 26, 20, 28 liters. That's a big uh, difference and uh, and it's, it saves uh, uh, CO2 emission as well. It's uh, but it's uh, as well maybe uh, lower emissions by 
the use of alternative fuels, so it might be biofuels or, or, or others. And of course, we, we can look, um, that's our uh, operational companies uh, have to look at, uh, to improve the logistic operations, to uh, avoid uh, um, empty, empty runs, uh, and there as well, digital solution help uh, or can help to, to do this. We have to train the drivers, and uh, I said um, IU is all, uh, as well dealing with the mobility of people, so maybe there's a shift from private car uh, to uh, co collective uh, transport in, in cities, uh, not on the, on, in, the, in the regional traffic, but in, in, in cities. The last uh, remark has nothing to do with one belt and one road, uh, of course, but, but there are a, a lot of measures. And, and f for, for example, it's, it's also an obligation for the, for the governments and for the political responsib responsible people, uh, not only to set goals, let's say we have to reach 50% reduction to this year and to this year's, but to look as well on the operational side for the low-hanging fruits, for example, using uh, bigger trucks, longer trucks, uh, because um, beside the construction uh, field, maybe, but but normally it's it's not the weight of a truck. It's it's today it's a volume. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you if you look, because it's uh, a truck is for let's say two thirds uh, of the cases it, it is full. Uh, but it doesn't reach the maximum uh, weight. So the modular concept, longer longer vehicles, sometimes more weight. This can save, uh, for example, if you were with a modular concept from uh, three trucks, you can make two. This helps for driver shortage as well, but for efficiency for the companies and at the same time uh, for the efficiency of the environmental environment. Thank you very much. Um, I'm giving some hand signals because I'm very eager to um, save some time for audience questions as well, but I'd like to um, talk briefly about the environment uh, and water. So let me start, first of all, with uh, international maritime, and then we'll come to inland uh, waterways. And the IMO last year, Mr. Mussolini, Mr. Mussolino, uh, adopted, <laughs> adopted an initial strategy that will set the ambition, or has set the ambition, to reduce the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions of international sh shipping by 50% by 2050, uh, on a basis of the 2008 emissions, and to cut carbon intensity by at least 40% by 2030. So what will that mean? That's never going to happen with the actual trends. It's, it's poster measures. They're beautiful to, to, to send out on, on, on you know, the websites and the papers. But it's not going to happen because it's, actual, it's actual, actually going exactly the other way around. You know, we've got bigger and bigger vessels, and the the, the, the the, well, the market is going there, not because it's more efficient. We're going to see them, you know, I wasn't around, but where well, I was around, but I was a kid. But 30 years ago, everybody had to have a super tanker. It was, everybody was investing in super tanker. Do you know how many super tankers are around and sailing right now? One. They scrapped them all. But it was a statement back then. Nowadays, you need to have a 23,000 to you. How many ports are able to host at 23,000 to you in an efficient manner, almost nobody. So you need to use feeders. Feeders are becoming 14, 13, even uh, 16,000 to use the mega vessels of three years ago. Does that mean that we are making anything more efficient? No, but we're making sort of like a, a, a big testosterone competition <laughs> that has nothing to do Strangely with Strangely enough, that's the second time I've heard that word used in panel discussions today. Isn't that interesting? Because as you can see, it's a very gender-oriented uh, market, and probably the, the, the hormones have an influence in the decisions. Uh, you know, there, there was a big thing about the, the financial crisis 10 years ago, uh, done essentially by the excess of testosterone. Shipping is not much different. <laughs> at the moment. But the point is, we need to go back on realistic goals. Example, I, I'm very much, uh, the, the, the most renewable, or, or, or let's put it this way, the best renewable energy is efficiency. Mm. Because it's already there. We don't need to invent hydrogen. We don't need to do mm. anything. We need to do things better. I give you an example which is kind of working very much with, uh, with, with Mr. Lapro. 
we, I have in, in my gates, in some of the ports, I have the opportunity to handle, I, I you know, chair four ports. But the biggest one have some automatic gates and we broke everything automated. By the, the loading moment where all the trucks are coming, it's a window between seven o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock in the morning. They stay idle on a queue for two hours waiting for loading, which is moronic. Sorry for the world. It, it's, it does make no sense with a simple app telling to the companies, okay, now the terminal A is efficient, go and bring the, your trucks there, and then your trucks are coming two hours afterwards, and your truck three hours afterwards. That would be much more efficiency, less pollution in the city, less emissions in the city, there's nothing new to invent. It's just a matter of putting brains together and make a better and a, a more efficient system. But we need to break the wall of, we always don't like that. We've always done like that. My father was doing that. My grandfather founded the company. Why should I change? Because it makes sense. And so you need to invent, as also as a, let's say, public side, not just punishment thresholds, but also prizes for those who are yeah, most, yeah. Mo most virtuous. Because normally it's working better. You know, if you're telling somebody, well, I'm going to punish you for that, or you're going to have advantages out of that, normally the guy who's giving, taking the advantages is making that more efficient. So, sorry, I, I just make a couple of examples, but it's plenty, plenty of, of these things. The paperwork, uh, the CMR, a lot of people are still there, you know, with the three piece of paper. They want a stamp, and if they don't see the stamp, they don't go sleeping in the evening, you know? And, and it, it, everybody has a, a boarding pass on, on, on the mobile phone. I can't see why we can't make a better system, making everything faster, because then you don't need to stop at the gate, there are no custom controls, at, at least on the paper, the CMR, and so on and so forth. Less uh, jam, less pollution. Cities are working better. Urban mobility is benefiting. Inland waterways, uh, last point, I have the, the luck of also chairing a port that, is, that has the only inland waterway of Italy. Every time I can use a barge, I take away 70 trucks from the streets. 70, 70, it's one barge. And then if you make a better system where you have hubs that are distributing the, the goods, and then you just make the very last mile, not the 100 kilometers, but the 10 kilometers by truck, then again, there's nothing to invent. We don't need to invent Star Trek teleport. It's already there. But we need to put our brains in a more systemic way and thinking how to make things more efficient. Great, thank you very much. Mr. George, we just heard from Mr. Mussolino that uh, the standards set by the IMO are basically window dressing. So, of course, I have to ask you whether the CCNR vision of zero emissions is also just window dressing, or would you say there is a realistic uh, possibility that this will be implemented? Well, thank you for that. But also, if I would like to pick up on what was said by Mr. Tiwari when he spoke of cities, because you, you addressed a lot of the situation, of course, in cities. There is a kind of rediscovery on larger rivers, but also on smaller rivers for cities, in incorporating, integrating the role of inland waterway transport. I think you hinted at that, but it's an interesting phenomenon when we speak of the need for a mode of transport to to keep a good watch on those general trends, uh, or trade routes, trade flows, but also societies developing and adjusting resilient, uh, resilience of, of transport. On environment, window dressing, I hope not, uh, Melinda. I hope not, uh, shall I say, and you referred kindly to this uh, uh, commitment of our ministers of uh, transport uh, repeated in um, October last year to aim for uh, zero emission uh, inland navigation by 2050. For that, there is, there is a lot to be done. Um, our colleague, uh, Mr. Mussolino, uh, referred to efficiency, and I do agree with this. We may come back to the digitalization uh, support in all this, uh, and I, I would be happy to speak of uh, river information services, what we do in terms of integrating in the supply chain of inland waterway. Uh, those, those vessels, uh, the, the problem is there. They have to, uh, to reach uh, locks, they have to reach uh, uh, harbors, ports on time to make sure that uh, it is done in an optimal way. Um, there are, of course, lots of pilot projects ongoing. It is true that inland waterway transport system 
remains very much, and you kindly reminded us of the, the, those figures, what you can spare in terms of, uh, of, of road transport uh, using those ships when, when possible. Um, these, um, uh, the, the transport uh, over waterways remains very much an environmentally friendly mode of transport. But there is a general and, and, a, and a real recognition given that all modes of transport and all other sectors in our economy aim to uh, improve their CO2 emissions, uh, performance, and other pollutions, and so on, that the sector takes that very seriously. We have 30 years to go. There are new technologies being tested. There will be new engines. There will be uh, new uh, propulsion systems. There will be the use of new fuels. And then, of course, this idea of, uh, of efficiency. You kindly reminded us that the CCNI is more a regulatory body, so we are dealing with safety issues, environmental issues, but specifications for vessels will also have an impact on environment uh, as well. Thank you very much. So I thought we might do two additional rounds of questions, but looking at my watch, I think realistically we'll do one, and it will be largely about data issues because all of you have brought them up, and I think there's quite a bit more to be said. But if you want to add to your um, remarks something about the way that innovative ways that you are cooperating with other partners, feel free to do that, but perhaps let's now shift the focus to data because I want to do the last 20 minutes uh, definitely with the audience if we can. So I'm going to ask for quick responses if you would. So we all know new technologies that allow the tracking uh, of freight are absolutely changing this business in so many ways and making things possible that wouldn't have been possible before in terms of speed, efficiency, flexibility, and more. So I'd like to ask all of you to talk a little bit about, again, how that's affecting your particular sector or uh, business or region. And I will just launch a couple of specific questions, but you can speak to broader issues too, if you like. So to you, Stephen Cotton, in that social sustainability space, how do you see data playing a role there? What can they do or what are the prerequisites for data to become a force for social sustainability in supply chains? Okay, I think I'm um, going to kind of address what's not working and then try to put forward some proposal. And I think uh, Pino kind of took some of the, the fire out of that. And there's also this conversation about the last mile. At the moment, we're, uh, and part of the reason transportation doesn't have the highest reputation as a labour opportunity is because the cost has been driven down because it's a competitive market. So if you've got four parcel providers competing from four different entry points, then ultimately you're going to have four sets of delivery, four sets of drop-off, and that doesn't help congestions for cities. So there's this question. And then the other question is a conversation about who owns data and who should be entitled to take a profit from data. And again, we're discussing with IRU and our other partners that if you're, you know, when we touch on the future of work, we believe there's a high level of product placement. And that's partly because the manufacturers own the data. So if you're a truck operator, you know the busiest European routes because you're collecting data off the trucks you sold to someone else. And the part of our challenge for this global supply chain and data is governments have to have a look at it, but also human beings need to, you know, we can do who's, who hasn't got a mobile phone here today. The reality is someone's monitoring you all the time and that goes into the future of work, into the future of supply chains and what do we want? Sometimes we don't know what we want. So the reality has to be governments, industry stakeholders and I would just really strengthen our commitment to our colleagues, whichever side of the table we sit on. The reality is workers need good employers. Good employers need to make a good return on their investment and part of data is that conversation. If individual companies own all the data and we sit in these environments and we see pilots and many of the data that's reduced in those pilots never makes it into the, pop, into the public society. So the reality is if you're Uber and you run a model in Boston and you claim that the congestion's better, I defy that, the reality is more, the richer people can use Uber 
and that's created a, a problem about data. So for us in the ITF, we believe that data should belong to the society and the society should be able to make some equitable return on that data so that we can start to formalise some societal policy movements. So we in the ITF will sign up with IRU, UITP, the other industry players to have a voice to lobby government to make good rules about data that means society shares in the profit and it doesn't continue to feed the 1%. Very interesting. Are you satisfied with what the European Union is beginning to do in this space? Because as you know, I'm sure they are moving toward a new vision of data that would essentially be the property of citizens and not of companies. Yeah, I think, I think there's kind of two different models out there where the government owns data and there's a little bit of cynicism about whether Big Brother government actually will share that in the truest sense. But there's a reality that, yes, we should look, we should understand what is happening to the data collected. You know, we, we don't need to address the ability for Facebook to manipulate situations and examples like that. But the reality is the people have to have confidence in the future, in ownership of that data, and what we would call is public policy development. And data should form when we see so many rapid changes. We need to build confidence in workers as part of society and society as a whole to make the difference to give us a sustainable transportation, which ultimately underpins the whole economy. Let me jump over to Mr. Tiwari because you mentioned some related uh, issues uh, earlier on when you talked about uh, cities and, uh, and the importance of data for cities in terms of their uh, work on uh, first and last mile. So maybe you can add a little bit here as far as the role of data for cities and the prerequisites that have to be met in order for data to play a positive role for enhancing sustainability of supply chains in cities. Yeah, thank you. Um, so maybe I just focus a little bit more on the developing countries since we are looking at trade shifting there, we are looking at urbanization right. happening there. Right. Uh, and if you look at that, yes, it is not only in this sector, it's across sectors, there is a dearth of data. There is a dearth of capacities to process that data and to utilize that data that is there at the city level. That is definitely a given. But if you look at it just from an urban freight perspective, I think a couple of issues need to be taken into account. One is that the, the whole issue of cities generally prioritizing passenger transport rather than freight transport. And if you, you look, there was a comprehensive study done on urban policies in developing countries which found that only 5% of them actually look at urban freight there is about 50% are looking at passenger transport. So they're not, it's not really a focus for most of the cities, uh, you know, the national level. Um, and so there isn't really a felt need for collecting data on that front. Secondly, what you also find is that uh, this whole issue of urban freight is nobody's baby. So you have the national governments who believe that it is the responsibility of the local governments. The local governments believe it's the responsibility of the private sector. The private sector believes that it's the responsibility of the national and the local governments. And so there is no sense of ownership of this issue. And therefore, nobody's really uh, you know, putting their heart and soul into it and looking at collecting data. So these are a couple of issues that need to be kept in mind while, and these, so these are issues that really need to be addressed. And therefore, by bringing cities more into the dialogues in terms of any kind of urban freight from a social perspective, from an urban environmental perspective, of bringing them to the table uh, and having, involving them in policy making, but for cities to also then include the key stakeholders, especially the private sector, and setting up these kind of multi-stakeholder forums where they can look at integrated approaches so that there is a number of data points which are scattered, but these need to be then brought together. So I think three things that would really need to be done is one, that this mandate needs to be clarified, probably at the local level that you know cities need to focus on this and therefore they would need the data for the, for the planning. Secondly, that they would need systems and capacities to be able to capture and process and utilize the data for better planning. And thirdly, for all of this to happen, they need a budget. And very often it's that budget angle that's also missing in addition to the capacities. So these are some of the challenges that uh, the cities typically face 
on urban freight, but also for a number of other sectors. Thank you very much. Mr. Georges, let me ask you about two different aspects uh, of data in regard to inland waterway uh, transport. One very specific, I know your organization's been working on something called River Information Service Standards, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the role of that is and what, what its aim uh, is. And then beyond that, cybersecurity. Um, because clearly the more that we talk about data as this crucial, crucial force of efficiency and integration of supply chains, we're also talking about sensitivity. Um, and maybe you can speak to both of those aspects. Thank you, thank you, Melinda. Uh, yes, you're right. We we still believe uh, very much that uh, digitalization uh, can be a, an essential tool to reach uh, the aim of a sustainable mode of transport. In our case, o over the waterway. Um, to do that, I took note of a number of pitfalls and uh, uh, questions, major questions that have to be asked regarding data. Uh, you referred to the, to the Central Commission. I'm speaking as, uh, as Secretary General of this organization for the Rhine. For obvious reasons, the Rhine is still uh, re responsible for two-thirds of uh, European inland waterway. But beyond that, we part of uh, the trans-European network corridors. We have the, the, this, this main Rhine-Alpine corridor uh, crossing the, the Rhine, going as far as uh, uh, Italy, uh, but we're part of a, of a broader network. So in the whole um, uh, region of, of the corridor, we have developed traditionally those river information services that allow uh, exchange of uh, harmonized uh, information on, on ships, on a number of uh, uh, elements that increases safety, that increases efficiency uh, for, for the, the connections with, with ports. And there is a, there a lot of potential in the future to, uh, to accommodate more the needs of integration within the other uh, transport modes. If we want to promote the multimodality, this river information services we started to work on years ago with uh, concrete applications, and you will find associations on the upper, upper river Rhine, for instance, between Germany, France, and Switzerland. These are concrete applications to improve um, the, the navigation. You can speak of uh, infrastructure, transport and traffic management through uh, those river information services. Nowadays, we work more and more, and we will do so ever more with the European Union, with the European Commission, to develop those standards in the future. There are today expert groups uh, that will be integrated in a new European Committee for Standardization in Inland Navigation that we do support as secretariat, as executive uh, body for this committee. And in the coming years, we will uh, integrate those groups and develop new standards on, on, in that field. We will do so in close connection with the European Commission, and so I take note of all those developments. The intention would be to create a digital inland navigation area, so-called DINA. So you see there is there a lot of uh, uh, hope in uh, developing the river information services ever, ever more. As you said, we believe that uh, if we embark on digitalization, we should be aware of uh, of the risks that that can be uh, that can entail this uh, this move, and we we have um, increased awareness among the the sector uh, about those risks coming up. We are not aware yet of any major problem, but we know that in the maritime sector and in other sectors, it is, it is an issue. If you look at uh, automation, which is also a topic uh, of interest to us, not only in the maritime road and, and the other sectors, we, we, we are, of course, um, uh, well aware of, the, of, of some dangers that could come out of this. So we have uh, issued uh, 
some uh, wear, uh, wear, uh, awakening uh, papers on the topic and uh, we will work further in September. We will build on that, uh, on that work together with associations uh, to develop this, uh, this uh, growing awareness and, and response to those dangers and risks. Thank you very much. And one last question to you, Mr. Mussolino, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, you gave us some very compelling examples already of applications that could really change uh, the business uh, and the efficiency at ports. So maybe let me ask you another question that is related to that, and then you can add if you wish. But, and my question would be, who needs to drive that kind of change? Because we didn't have our, our discussion about coordination to the extent that I would have wanted to. So we're talking, when we talk about intermodality, we're clearly talking about com complex coordination mm -hmm. efforts. Who needs to drive that? Do you have examples of collaborative approaches that have worked to help introduce the kind of data yeah, applications? Yeah, I would say, well, for example, uh, the, the TNT network and the Europe, in the European framework and the corridors are a very good example of, of a public uh, sovereign national, international body that is kind of forcing everybody to adopt a certain amount of common things, a certain amount of uh, procedures and measures that are kind of uh, moving along the, the efficiency. So I can speak for, for the you know, reality I'm living with. Uh, I don't know exactly how it works in, in other areas of the planet, but I would say that what we have done in terms of logistics and, in, and efficiency in, in Europe has been so far very good. And, and the new 10T revision 2023 should be uh, an occasion of even more uh, challenging our skills and capacity because you know you bring into the corridors you bring the cities you bring the regions you bring the ports authorities you bring the dry ports you bring the private uh, companies you so you have a variety of stakeholders public and private and together uh, not, it's not always easy uh, and I, I wouldn't say that it's the easiest of the jobs but but you have very 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 fruitful discussions at eventually even if they last for more than a meeting and a lot of papers, uh, eventually they, they are bringing results. So I, I think that you know discussing uh, with an open mind and, and without uh, a, a pre-constructed position is helping in finding solutions. Of course, you know everybody has his own or her own interests. Of course, you know I'm a president of a post authority. I cannot just give it away to the city because, you know, cities tend to kind of have an expanding uh, passion. So they would like to enter into the port and take away areas from the port because they are nice <laughs> yes. and tidy <laughs> and beautiful. And we have the same idea, like, no, why, why do you want that road? That we, I could build a beautiful railway there and don't do that. But, you know, if you start to talk together and have a sort of like a third party regulator, which is, you know, the higher level, the region, rather than the national level, rather than the European level. Then you can find uh, good compromises that are going along uh, uh, that way. And through the corridors, again, uh, we can export best practices. In fact, also the, the, the forum of corridors in, in, in mm -hmm. the European TNT network are essentially that. You are sharing best practices. You are called uh, to, to tell and <clears throat> explain to other people from other areas of, of, of the union uh, what you've done and how you can share those knowledge and, and that knowledge and, and, and how you can develop better things. It's, again, it's a long process. It's not a process that's happening overnight. It's not always pleasant. I guarantee you, but it, it, it's, it's fruitful. I mean, talking more, discussing more, open mind, and, 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 and kind of, you know, not having a, a pre-constructed position on a topic. I have to say, when I hear um, statements like that, I kind of wish, now I'm saying this as a political journalist looking toward this weekend in Europe, um, I wish Eurosceptics were sitting in on some of the discussions we have here with their nuts and bolts, concrete uh, uh, tributes to what something like 10T can mean in terms of, of processes um, and their benefits. So that's just a little editorializing from my point of view. Mr. Lavreau, please. Do a short comment on, on this, uh, and it's about connectivity. Uh, I, I think um, we should not only connect infrastructure or techniques and everything, we should, for the low-hanging fruit, much more connect our minds. So think together about simple solution and not always looking to, to the highest level, uh, the highest possibility in 10 to 20 years. There are a lot of... Uh, uh, low-hanging fruit and fruits and coming back to data to, to optimize uh, the data flow and to, to manage it in an intelligent way along the supply chain 
gives us a lot of opportunities to be more efficient, to reduce emissions and, and everything we have been talking about. So let's stick together across all modes and on, uh, of, of transport and put together our minds to find a common solution for, for the society. Thank you very much. I'd like to open now to audience questions. So if you have a question, we have microphones in the room. I have a question here in the back row um, and then one here and one there. So um, we'll bundle a few questions, I think. Th and do tell us who you are. Yes, thank you very much. My name's Emma McLennan. I'm Director General of something called EAST. We're the Eastern Alliance for Safe and Sustainable Transport. And we work in 15 countries. Uh, there's basically China Belt and Road countries, uh, uh, Eastern Partnership countries, uh, South Caucasus. And all of the countries where we work, road safety is a major concern. And I want to pick up on things that Stephen Cotton and Christian Labro said about labor issues and social issues. And I'm particularly concerned about the pressure that we're putting drivers under in terms of their hours of work, uh, everything else that it's been mentioned, but also the fact that those people who are designing the infrastructure don't always think of rest stops for truckers. They don't always think of secure places where they can park their vehicles and keep the goods safe. They don't, there's so much pressure to get, you're nodding here, I know you from the IRU. There's so much pressure mm -hmm. to deliver in time. I know people, drivers who are going along the Pamir Highway midwinter with huge pressure to deliver to the big department store in central Tajikistan. How can all of you providers, all of you players in the industry, impress upon the people building that infrastructure that maybe slower is safer, slower is more secure, and we need those rest stops. We need those, we need to think of these people as human beings. They're not a delivery mechanism. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to bundle a couple of questions and then come to the panel. I have a question here in the um, second row on this side. Okay, can I get one up here too, please? Um, a mic up here? I'm sorry, I was trying to take them in the order they came in, but then go ahead, please. Uh, good evening, I'm Arnab Bandupadhyay from World Bank, uh, based in India. Uh, thanks very much for a very vibrant uh, panel discussion. Uh, you know, to my mind, I think the challenge of integrating the local and the global supply chain largely, largely actually is rooted in how this uh, supply chains are managed, whereas the global supply chains are managed end-to-end -end by large players. The local supply chains are very fragmented, particularly in developing countries, as you know, you know, across different tiers of government, which Mr. Tiwari was mentioning, across the, uh, you know, the warehouse owners, the truckers, the transport operators. So my question to the panel is, uh, how do you actually facilitate or incentivize fusion of these two chains, because you're talking about what I understand is the local and global supply chain. And I have a, a very brief second question, which is very specific on, uh, in this context of linking local and global supply chain, uh, what do you see the opportunities and constraints of linking coastal shipping with inland waterways? Because we have actually two panelists uh, from maritime sector, so. Thank you very much. Let me take, oh, okay, um, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, hello. I'm a, um, a gender equality specialist, which is not directly related to my question, but perhaps indirectly. Um, I just had a question around uh, the urban freight situation that we have and how it's really become a bit of a disaster culturally um, in terms of small shops closing down in cities, uh, socially and environmentally, obviously. Um, and I just wonder about the pressure being put on the tech platforms like Amazon uh, to play their role in terms of compensating for for that and also around educating people to show some restraint. Um, I think that's a key part of things that I haven't heard much about restraint as a, as a general theme. Um, and I suppose my final comment on that is just that idea of restraint. I don't hear companies saying, we thought about digitalizing this, but we decided not to. Or I thought about... Um, making this bigger, this ship bigger, um, but we decided for social and environmental reasons not to, and we think that's smart. Uh, that would be great. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Let me take one more, and then we will come uh, to some answers. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My original question was actually going to be about 
big data, cybersecurity, data localization. And then I heard Pino talk about bigger and bigger vessels. Apologies, I am Elio Vicente from the International Chamber of Shipping. So we represent ship owners worldwide. Hi, Stephen. Uh, I heard uh, Pino talk about bigger and bigger vessels and potentially implying, unless I heard it incorrectly, that these, are co these actually cause uh, bigger emissions. Um, but if, if, if we look at megaships, as you, uh, as you called it, uh, one megaship is now capable of carrying what two or three could carry some years ago. So in fact, when you look at it from an environmental perspective, actually a megaship uh, brings environmental benefits, just to clarify that. Uh, the, the other point, and, and I'm sorry these are comments, but having heard... Go ahead, uh, it's all right. What, yeah, yep. uh, about the IMO and what has been agreed in terms of environmental <laughs> performance. Uh, looking at the, what I, IMO agreed specifically, we're looking at a 50% cut by 2050. Nobody is under any illusions. Uh, there is just no technology there right now to reach that goal, uh, commercially available and viable. So we know that research and development is key for that. We've already started that, and we are, we've, we've got ideas for how to ramp that up. Looking at the shorter term measures, uh, uh, which, which Pino also criticised. We're looking at a 40% improvement by 2030, and we're looking at a 70% improvement, hopefully, in terms of efficiency by 2050. Uh, how are we going to get these improvements in terms of energy efficiency? We're looking at short-term measures that, in, among other things, relate to the design and the operation, operation of ships. Uh, there are regulatory frameworks that have already been agreed, uh, which will take effect in 2025, and these will already deliver 30% reduction. So the 40% improvement uh, is very much feasible. So I was really, really surprised, and I, I, I'd be interested to okay. hear. Uh, Great. I'm going to cut you off there because otherwise we won't be able to get the, the panel's responses. But thank you very much for that statement and um, Mr. Mussolino will have a chance in a moment to respond. But let me just maybe go down the panel and ask you to speak to whichever aspects you would like to address, but if possible briefly since we're actually pretty much at the end of our window. So Stephen Cotton, one question was design for safety and human needs uh, would be one thing you might speak to and then if you want to address any of the others, feel Free. I think there's a there's kind of I'm going to try and connect up some of the questions. Please. So if we look at trucking, we would identify that historical trucking as we knew it doesn't really exist, and we we now recognise a global phenomenon of, of an economic employer. So the reality is the pressure goes on the haulage company to deliver it at a lower cost, putting pressure on either the truck driver or the owner operator to deliver it just in time for the consumer. So ultimately, you have to look at it in different ways. It, the days of a union arguing with the truck operator about the terms and conditions, we still do that. But the reality is that isn't the answer itself because the pressure goes on, um, on, on the truck driver, the haulage company, the whole process. And we've looked at, Australia has examples, the political situation at the weekend won't help, that there would be some safe rates, as we describe it, that you should have a minimum playing field. In whichever model you use for your mathematics, if a truck driver cannot make a decent living out of his truck or the haulage company can't run his fleet economically, then the pressures we've heard, and then we hear about drugs, then we hear about road incidents, and then we hear about societal issues that impact on the process. And you can roll that out. To yeah. <laughs> we also sign through our European body with the IRU a study on truck stops and would you believe we've got evidence that people rob trucks of their keepings if they're not in a secure environment, if there isn't a place to have food or wash or shower or basic facilities and together the ETF and the IRU have produced studies. 
We don't even have a study on Southeast in Asia Pacific, booming region. We can't even do a study, and we're trying to find some donors. If there's anyone in the room who wants to help us with this sure. on the logistics for Southeast Asia, we all talk about the booming economy, but we can't even statistically prove there's an issue. And if you imagine there's an issue in Europe, take it to Africa, take it to Asia. So there's challenges for all of us, and that is the economic employer. I think the conversation about consumerism, which I think is ultimately the question, and this comes back to the regulatory piece, if there isn't better regulation, and again, we've been looking at the World Economic Forum and other environments, the United Nations, does it have enough authority? Does the World Trade Organization have enough authority to watch the politics going on around them, because ultimately, if you don't give the bodies the authority to strategize, learn about the data and formulate level playing fields that allow corporations to make money and the workers have an equitable share, you'll never have an answer to the consumerism, because bigger is better and transportation should be cheaper, which isn't a sustainable answer. Yeah. And one last thing is the sense of there is technology about the environment, and there are certain shipping companies that are can, have proven to us, that's their union counterparts, that they can move from fossil fuel to electric engines, double the size of their capacity of their ships, and drive it by water propulsion. So there is technology out there in the process, but they're paying for that over and above the market. I'm not quite sure how the business model works, works for them because they're competing with people that will struggle to comply with the medium-term IMO regulations about opportunities. And then the big question, which I think you touched on and everybody touches on, we imagine that certain parts of the world will come in with quite aggressive environmental regulations about the cities, about pollution. And the question is, where are we going to pass that cost to? Because ultimately, governments have to charge more to the corporations economic employers that are making profit out of a low-cost supply chain that means transportation has put the pressure all the way down on the, lock, on the line to ultimately the worker mm. is paying for their own pocket to drive their truck, to queue up at a border. So those are issues we've all got to challenge and we do have to give the traditional organisations the power to make a difference. Thank you. Mr Georges. Very quickly, I think a question was addressed um, uh, partly to me on on the on the link between coastal transport and uh, and river transport, and I see we have a, a representative here of uh, of Erstu, uh, the, the Sea River Transport Union, um, in Duisburg and Berlin, uh, would certainly be able to say uh, much better than I than I could uh, the, the the interest of of this special segment of transport. Uh, this, is, this is a topic that we are about to, to deepen uh, for, for the coming year together and at the request also partly of the European Commission, having identified the, 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 the use uh, of, of this uh, special uh, means of transportation. Uh, there are a number of ports already practicing that heavily, and uh, we, I refer to Duisburg, uh, which is the, the, the most important inland port in Europe. Uh, but there are other applications uh, throughout Europe, and hopefully there are, there are many more to come. So this is the general comment that I wanted to, to make. In terms of uh, reaching targets in the field of reducing CO2 or pollutant emissions, I'm aware of uh, a very sensitive, difficult discussion in all modes of transport. It's the case for us. You, you use the word window, window uh, uh, dressing. In this case, uh, shall I just say that uh, the CCNR and certainly the Secretariat will keep a very close eye on this and try to reach that. We will do our utmost. You never know what is going to happen in 50 years, but all efforts are being made in, uh, in many respects, uh, uh, as I said earlier. Now, this, this question remains tough. We are speaking of vessels. Those vessels have a very long duration of life. We should never forget that. If we have trucks, I mean, it's a very different environment than, sh than vessels that uh, would last uh, 30, 40, 50 years, even longer. 
How can you renew such a fleet? How can you update it? Uh, and there are so many challenges coming up along the way. We, we touched on environment. I, if, if you think of the whole issue of uh, low water, which is an important topic yeah. for us uh, today, and which is going to remain an important topic, that will require a number of responses, including in, the, in, um, in terms of shaping ships and uh, renewing the whole thing. So behind be beyond the engines, propulsion systems, there are so many um, instruments that are going to be used to improve the general situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lebel. I try to be short, uh, so not complete, but, but short. Looking to your question to, to road safety and parking, uh, uh, parking areas, that's exactly a, a problem, but not only for the new One Belt, One Road initiative, it's, it's a much bigger problem uh, in, uh, in the center of, of Europe. And you have to consider that we are working as IU, and uh, Stephen said it uh, together with ITF and the European Commission to, to build some more safe and, and secure parking places. We uh, developed some apps for, for the drivers to, to find empty parking spaces, but uh, that's not enough to uh, done be because the problems are still there. And on the other hand, the governments decided, for example, to, to give you uh, the, the, the opposite. They decided that the uh, driver can't uh, spend uh, the regular rest time anymore in the, in the cabin, which is in the most cases very comfortable and, and, and so on. So with, without having uh, solved the problem, where can the driver then spend the, the rest, driving rest time? Um, to the question of uh, local and global supply chain and how to facilitate, there's one possibility offered by, by IU to uh, facilitate uh, the, the global supply chain until the, the, the local uh, rest. Uh, so if, if I said at the beginning, uh, road transport is always at the start and at the, the end point, it's, it's as well an intermodal tier, uh, so you can use it for every mode of, of transport and that can facilitate. Uh, one short, more personal remark on the urban freight situation and, and compensation of Amazon or, or others. There are, as always, different theories uh, because there are people as well uh, talking about saving emissions by, by Amazon and co because they are bundling uh, deliveries and they avoid individual people to drive with, mm -hmm. uh, with their car, only one person seated into the city, driving around looking for a parking space and, and back, and a, a small truck by, by Amazon or, or others bundles all the deliveries, and it's much more efficient. So about this, we can as well discuss for hours, so I would end there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Mussolino. Yeah, well, there were a couple of nice questions, but I'm afraid I have to, to answer essentially to that that was addressed to me. Uh, first, uh, let's clarify. I am a shipping lawyer. I have worked for shipping lines. I have no problem with the ships whatsoever, and, and I like ships very much, but uh, your approach is limited to the ships. I tell you what is the carbon footprint and the impact on the environment of a big ship in a port, which means a lot of cost of dredging, a lot of land consuming, because you need to make bigger birds bigger, uh, bigger case, uh, better, more efficient uh, railways. So the impact in terms of environment on a specific port, on a port area or a cluster, is much, much bigger than the pure emission of the air or the, uh, the, the efficiency uh, given by the ship. Like, uh, what I was saying is that at the moment, a 23,000 TU is just giving benefit to the economy of scale of the guy who's owning the vessel. In terms of, again, factoring a holistic approach and an equation that takes into account many more things, you'll see that the 23,000 TU gives much uh, less benefits to the port or to the land or to the territory that is serving or uh, calling than those that you are thinking just if you think about the vessel. I understand that. I mean, if you are from the ship side, it's totally understandable. You are advocating your position. I am 
in a sort of way, at the moment, in this stage, I am uh, governing a public body that has the uh, task, the primary task, to develop port activities, but I'm not extraterritorial. I'm nearby a city, I have, I have a territory around me, and I can tell you that the cost of complying with the requests of big shipping lines, it's in terms of environment and sustainability, it's, it's not really, at the moment, properly factored, nor calculated, nor fully understood in terms of the advantages. Again, if we take only the economical advantage of the economy of scale given to the ship, 100%. Let's make 25,000, 20, 29,000, 35,000, as much as, as the, te the technical uh, limits can, can give us the, the opportunity. But it's not that <clears throat> that's the, the real way that I, from the actual point of view that I have, uh, I can, I can examine and assess the situation. That's, that's what we can say. And it's not about uh, demonizing or, or making an, any, any witch hunt. It's about data, and the data are, are there. Again, uh, United States, yeah, sorry. I stop. <laughs> no problem. I just want to make sure that Mr. Yes, Tiwari gets a, a minute or two for his concluding remarks. Problem. And uh, thank you very much. And if you want to continue the discussion with each other, then perhaps no, no, you can fine. do it uh, in me. one of the breaks. So please, Mr. Tiwari, last word. Thank you. Uh, so just on the issue of consumerism, in addition to the point that you made about, about that, it, it's a much more complicated point which is there because it's also looking at creating jobs elsewhere. But I think just the point I'd like to make and that a lot of that is in terms of how we consume. And uh, there are work that is another program that we have which looks at sustainable procurement and consumption and that at a city level but there is also then at the citizen level in terms of how we are procuring our goods and services. And that I think somebody links up also to the other point and how do you link from the local to the international, the global level. Because that through the such programs very often uh, cities are displacing their externalities to another geographical location. Uh, so we have to see as to that that does not happen, but you can, that can also have positive externalities and so how can we actually promote those. But also the cities and local governments need to work within a national framework. And so one of the things that we really focus on is how do you improve coordination and collaborative action between say national and local uh, governments and through that avenue, reaching out to the global players as well. Thank you very much. Let's give our panel a very warm round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks to all of you. Thanks as well to all of our translators who are up there working hard. Thanks uh, to all of the organizational and uh, technical uh, staff who have made this possible, of course, to the ITF. And especially thanks to you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention and your contributions to the discussion. I wish everybody a great evening. Thanks for being with us.